We gather tonight to celebrate the life and the passing into eternal life of the Lady Claire of Assisi. Our guide today will be this magnificent icon of St. Claire, painted around the year 1280 by an unknown artist. The original hangs above an altar in the Basilica of St. Claire in Assisi. This is a hagiographic or historiated icon, one that tells the story of the saint's life. The picture consists of a central panel of Claire and eight very carefully chosen scenes from her life. In the center panel, Claire stands in a plain gray tunic of unbleached wool. Around her waist is the cord with its three knots symbolizing the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. She wears a brown cloak of a poor, coarse woolen mixture, and on her head is a veil of thin black wool lined in white linen. In her left hand, Claire holds the short staff of the Jerusalem cross. This is the Crusaders' cross, the symbol sewn into their garments as a sign that they were pilgrims and soldiers who wished to rebuild the Jerusalem on earth. Claire wished to go to the Holy Land. One of the witnesses at her canonization testified. Before she was sick, she desired to go to those parts of Morocco where the brothers had suffered martyrdom. She had such a fervent spirit that she would have willingly endured martyrdom for the defense of the faith and her order for the love of God. With her right hand, Claire points to the cross and looks us in the eye. As in all icons, the viewer is part of the picture. And if you look closely at Claire's brow, in the middle of the thumbprint of the hand of God, which stands for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and is always present on the brows of saints in classical iconography, there is a delicate but distinct T. Innocent III had seen himself as the prophet Ezekiel, the man with the scribe's inkhorn, going out to mark the elect with a sign of the Tau. As it happens, Tau in the Hebrew alphabet is an X, but Pope Innocent III, Francis, Claire, and the painter of this panel all took it to be a Greek Tau, which is the letter T, and with which Francis signed his correspondence. At first glance, there is one important thing missing from the icon. Claire, repelling the Saracens with the Blessed Sacrament, is absent from the hygiographic scene, nor is she depicted as later artists have preferred to show her holding the monstrance. Instead, behind Claire's head in the center apse of the sanctuary, there is the recessed ground of an icon. Two angels uphold a heavily bordered halo. In the final glory of heaven, Claire has, as St. Augustine said, become what she has received. The dimensions of her personality are not changed, just as the wheaten nature of the host is not removed in the Mass. God does not absorb and destroy what God possesses but irradiates it with God's real presence. He, Christ, possesses Claire. Christ is present in Claire as he is present in the Eucharistic host. So it is Claire who is the monstrance of the radiant presence of God. The two flying angels who uphold Claire's halo emphasize this. They resemble the two angels found on either side of the host in the design of many early monstrances, including the one preserved in Assisi. 
This is the central meaning of the icon. This is not a picture postcard from Assisi. It is an encounter with God. One of the images Claire used to encourage this deeper intimacy with the beloved was the mirror. By looking into that mirror that is Christ and gazing on the face of Christ, one is transformed little by little into the very image of God. And one who is transformed by gazing on the glory of God shining on the face of Jesus becomes a mirror in which others can see the face of Christ. This is the purpose of painting the icon of a saint, that you look into his or her eyes and see the reflection of God. The first miniature from the Gospel of John. You did not choose me. No, I chose you to go out and bear much fruit. The story starts in the lowest of the miniatures on Claire's right hand. On the Feast of Palm Sunday, In the year of our Lord, 1212, the people at Mass file up to receive the blessed palms. Claire remains in her place, standing in front of her sister Agnes, surrounded by other women. Both sisters have crowns of myrtle, the symbol of fruitfulness and virginity. Claire wears a red dress with narrow openings that reveal a penitential hair cloth tunic underneath. Is she afraid? Does she think that her going out of the city walls planned for this night might lead as the first Palm Sunday led to Calvary? Or is it a sign Does Guido, Bishop of Assisi, know what is going to happen and gives it his blessing? All we know is that he stepped down from the altar to take the palm to the girl who has not come up for it. Claire believed this was a sign from God to proceed with her heart's desires. Jesus, my only desire. Jesus, my only desire. Jesus, my only desire.
Second miniature from the Gospel of Luke. Sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. The story continues with the second miniature above the first. So that evening, having given away to the poor all that she possessed, Claire left the home of her family through the door reserved for the departure of the dead. Francis and his brothers wait with lighted torches at the little church of St. Mary of the Angels that Francis has rebuilt. That night, Claire came alone to give her life to God, but the love of family and security that could hold her back is literally personified behind her. The five disapproving ladies shaking their fingers at the brothers and the furtive gentleman at the back are members of the Alfreduccio household. The woman, half clinging to and half offering Claire, is her mother, Ortolana, who later became a poor Claire herself. And the man lurking at the back is Uncle Minaldo, who will reappear in the fourth and fifth miniatures. Throughout this icon, the artist chose Francis with the marks of the nails in his hands and feet, not because he does not know that they came later, nor is it simply a trademark to identify Francis, for he already has one, his halo. Rather, it is a statement about the relationship of Francis and Claire, a meeting in the wounds of Christ. In his wounds is their peace, for the blood of Christ has made them one. Make me an instrument of your peace Where there is hatred Let me so love Third miniature from the Gospel of Matthew. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The story continues with the third miniature above the second. Inside the little church of St. Mary of the Angels, known as the Porthiancula, Claire now kneels, wearing the rough garment of penance. With scissors in hand, Francis snips away Claire's long hair. Claire is alone now, without even the symbolic presence of companions, but notice the small detail neatly painted beyond the sleeve of her habit is the cuff of her red dress. 
The painter knew that Francis would not have allowed the Lady Clare to undress with the thoroughness Francis showed at his own conversion. Their intimacy was not with each other, but with God. No matter how intently Claire looked into Francis for teaching and guidance, for friendship and community, Francis would never, never replace Jesus as the Lord of her heart and soul. Claire viewed this moment of consecration in the Forciancula as a sacrament of her union with her God. And she would hold fast to the total poverty of this ecstatic moment till the end of her days. Her fragrant words in her letter to Agnes of Prague carry the sweet aroma of her intense passion for Christ. As you meditate on the indescribable lights and riches and enduring honors Jesus offers you, and as you sigh along with all your heart, cry out to him with love. Draw me. We will follow you eagerly, heavenly bridegroom. I will run and not grow weary till you bring me to the banquet hall until your left hand is under my head and your right embraces me and you kiss me in loving welcome. Jesus, my only my life giving Lord Jesus my life giving Lord Jesus my joy Jesus my glory Jesus my God and my Fourth miniature from the Gospel of John. Do not be afraid, for I have overcome the world. The story continues with the fourth miniature above the third. So on Palm Sunday night, Francis escorted Claire to the Benedictine Monastery of San Paolo for a very practical reason. San Paolo had the right of sanctuary. If Claire took refuge there, she could not be dragged away by force. The Benedictines, shown here with striped edged veils, must have had a traumatic Holy Week, for the men of the Afroducio family arrived, trying to persuade Claire to give up such a worthless deed that was unbecoming to her class and without precedent in her family. But taking hold of the altar cloths, she bared her shorn head, maintaining that she would in no way be torn away from the service of Christ. The Lady Clare did not allow them to dissuade her from seeking her heart's desire, and they left without her. Jesus, my only Jesus. 
miniature from the gospel of john if they persecuted me they will persecute you also the story continues with the fifth miniature across from the fourth a few days later francis took claire to the little begin community of san angelo whose lifestyle was very different to that of the benedictines but claire's spirit could find no rest there. A fortnight later, Claire's younger sister, Agnes, ran away to join her. There was no rite of sanctuary at San Angelo, though, and Uncle Minaldo and his knights dragged Agnes out literally by her hair. But Claire prostrated herself in prayer with tears, and suddenly, the men seemed unable to drag Agnes any further. In a final fit of fury, Minaldo drew his sword to kill the girl. But Claire's prayers and the power of God paralyzed his arm. Claire came out from the church and persuaded them to go. This is the clarion way of confronting violence by prayer and persuasion. An inset in the top of this picture shows Agnes being received into the order. Her hands place in fealty between Claire's hands while Frances reaches out to cut off her hair. Claire's community was to be vastly different from the monastic communities of her time. At the heart of Claire's choice of this new way of life lay a deep and unwavering desire to follow the poor and humble Christ in all things. The Sixth Miniature from the Gospel of John Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home in them. The story continues with the Sixth Miniature beneath the Fifth. After this, Francis took Claire and Agnes to San Damiano. It was in this church that he had heard the voice from the crucifix saying, rebuild my church, which as you see is falling down. And it was here that Francis prophesied 
before he had a single brother. Here will come to dwell ladies who will glorify our Heavenly Father throughout his holy and universal church by their celebrated and holy manner of life. Together with her sisters, Claire wrote the first rule written for women religious by a woman. The objective of their life, as stated in that rule, is to observe the Holy Gospel by living in obedience, without property, and in chastity. The sisters were to live poorly. They would all be of equal rank, and all decisions affecting their life would be made by all of them. And when what they earn and what is given to them does not suffice, they beg. Here, two of Claire's miracles are shown. The first, one loaf of bread is being cut to feed 50 sisters. Part of it even going to the friars who served at San Damiano. One sister is seen carrying the cut off portion away. And the second, the oil jug, washed by Claire with her own hands, had been put out for one of the brothers to take begging, but was filled miraculously before he could even leave. In one of Claire's letters to Agnes of Prague, she breaks into rapturous praise of holy poverty. O oh, blessed poverty, who bestows eternal riches on those who love and embrace her. O oh, holy poverty, to those who possess and desire you, God promises the kingdom of heaven and offers indeed eternal glory and blessed light. O oh, God-centered poverty, whom the Lord Jesus Christ, who ruled and now rules in heaven and earth, who spoke and things were made, condescended to embrace before all else. Clothed in such poverty, Claire shines with a rare and luminous beauty. Seventh miniature from the Gospel of Matthew. At midnight there was a cry. Behold, the bridegroom is here. Come out to meet him. The story continues with the seventh miniature beneath the sixth. In this picture, Claire lies on a rough woolen mattress stuffed with straw on the stone floor at San Damiano. As she lies dying, she speaks these words. Go in peace, for thou wilt have a good escort. And the es this escort will be he. He who created thee, who sanctified thee, and who, after creating thee, put in thee his blessed spirit, who has always watched over thee as a mother watches over a beloved child. Sister Anastasia, asked the Lady Claire to whom she was speaking, and Claire replied, I was speaking to my soul. 
Sister Benvenuta, who knelt at her bedside and was a witness at Claire's canonization, testified, Then I suddenly saw with my own eyes a great multitude of virgins in white with crowns entering through the door of the room. And among the virgins, one who was more beautiful, wearing a magnificent crown. And they covered the Lady Clare with a most delicate cloth. Then the Virgin of Virgins bowed her head over Lady Clare and disappeared. The Blessed Mother had come to escort Claire to her bridegroom. Claire had called together all her sisters and commended to them the privilege of poverty. She had earnestly desired to have the rule of the order approved in a papal bull, saying that if she could but kiss the sill of that bull, she would then be well content to die. And it happened as she desired. For when one of the brothers brought the sealed papal letter, although Claire was very near to death, she took it in her hands and placed it on her mouth and kissed it. The next day, the Lady Claire passed from this life to God, passing into the eternal light. Even as a mother sees her child, so Thy Maker watches thee Who created thee at first Now perfects thee at last I am speaking to my most beloved soul My friend in whom I believe Now in peace for you will be Well escorted on your way Daughter, sister, do you see The King of glory as I do Who has loved thee tenderly now perfects the at last I am speaking to my most beloved soul My friend in whom I believe Go oh, now in peace for you will be Well escorted on your way may not remember all I say, only that which he allows, who sustained thee long ago, now perfects thee at the last. I am speaking to my most beloved soul. My friend in whom I believe Oh, now in peace for you will be Well escorted on your way Oh, now in peace for you will be Well escorted on your
The Eighth Miniature From the Gospel of Matthew Truly I say to you, wherever this good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. In the bottom miniature on Claire's left side, we have a veritable eyewitness picture of her funeral mass in the church of San Gregorio. Pope Innocent IV, who had already visited Claire on her deathbed, has come with his retinue to bury her. Claire lies on a trestle with her head on a scarlet and gold cushion that is still preserved at the Sacro Convento. The cushion and the pall, which is shown here matching it, were first used for the burial of Francis and are possibly the work and certainly the gift of the Lady Jacoba. The pillow is preserved with two other cloths embroidered by Jacoba and has the imperial insignia of eagles and lions. Behind Claire stands a brother holding the processional cross and the holy water. The brothers and those behind Pope Innocent are gazing at the Pope in surprise for he wished to admit the funeral mass and say that of the common of virgins instead. For to him, Claire was already a saint. The cardinals implored him to behave in a more seemly manner. And the irate prelate on his right is holding the missal firmly open at the words that begin the funeral liturgy. Lux perpetua luceat in aeternum. Let perpetual light shine on her forever. Although Claire's life was a secluded one, even in her own time, people stood in awe of the brightness her life cast. When Pope Alexander IV declared her a saint in the year of our Lord, 1255, just two years after her death, he did not use the standard form for canonization. He began his decree with a poetic play on her name, which means bright. This is what he wrote. Eau Claire, endowed with so many brilliant titles, bright even before your conversion, brighter in your manner of living, brighter still in your unclosed way of life, and brightest in the splendor after the course of your mortal life. She shone forth in life. She is radiant after death. Enlightening on earth, she dazzles in heaven. Oh, how great is the power of this light, and how intense is the brilliance of its illumination. While this light remained certainly in a hidden enclosure, it emitted sparkling rays outside. Placed in the confined area of the monastery, yet it was spread throughout the whole world. It should not be surprising that a light so illuminating could not be kept from shining bright brilliantly and giving clear light in the house of the Lord. Nor could a vessel filled with perfume be hidden so that it would not emit its fragrance and suffuse the Lord's house with a sweet aroma. Moreover, since in the austerity of her cloistered solitude, she broke the alabaster jar of her body with self-discipline, the whole church was thoroughly imbued with the aroma of her sanctity. Claire spent 41 years as a cloistered religious bedridden for the last 28 years. Her life was marked by her unrelenting commitment to radical poverty, by her intense love for the crucified Christ and for others. 
and by her deep spirit of prayer and contemplation. In her simplicity and poverty, she is a brilliant light, and we are filled with gratitude for the light of her example. May we, like Claire, be so filled with passionate love for Christ that we too blaze with his light and mirror Christ's love to all whom we encounter. What you hold, may you always hold. What you do, may you always do. And never abandon, never abandon. But with swift pace, light step, unswerving feet, so that even your steps stir up no dust. Go forward securely, joyfully and swiftly on the path of prudent happiness. Believing nothing, agreeing with nothing that would keep you from this resolution or that would place a stumbling block for you on the Let us pray. May God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us. May God be kind to us and give us peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.